Medisa is a um, not-for-profit organization, and these are our goals. And our goals are specifically to get government and the private sector to work together. And what we're looking to do is to capitalize innovation and entrepreneurship. So not only are we involved with, with tech startups, but we're also involved with SMEs. But entrepreneurship and innovation <coughs> is really going to be the catalyst for South Africa's regeneration. So we've been banging the drum for a while, but I think the time has come. The time has come for all of us, and the time has come for all of you. That entrepreneurs in South Africa are struggling, really struggling. They are funding themselves. They find it very difficult to actually access funding. They don't know where to go. The process is incredibly difficult. And what was quite astounding, what we found in the report this year, is the majority of entrepreneurs only need about 50,000 rand in terms of kind of startup capital, in terms of business development support, in terms of some tech for their business, and in the majority of cases actually aren't able to access that kind of funding. What was quite intriguing for me, I was very privileged to be at the investment summit um, that was held by the President on um, Friday. And what was highlighted by Ndiwe, um, the Minister of Small Business, is she's saying this is becoming a major focus in the context of helping businesses with the startup funding. Um, so, so that was quite kind of um, encouraging to hear, but very concerning. Um, and that's why platforms like Darlene are just so important in the current ecosystem to help entrepreneurs understand what funding is available and to really help simplify the process in terms of getting funding. Because the infrastructure in this country, you need to be a private investigator. There's nothing that falls <laughs> under kind of one center. And in fact, on one of the panels at the investment summit, Tito and Boweni said, we've got to resurrect that center, that organization called, what was it called in the old days, where it was kind of the umbrella for small business, that you went to one place where you could get all the necessary business development support, you could register your business. It was like a one-stop shop. Yeah, there's quite a bit out there in terms of support and stuff for small businesses, but you have to be a rocket scientist and a private investigator to find out where it is. I'll give you a couple of them. Um, but some of the main things that, um, were that because we have such a concentrated um, banking sector in South Africa, or the big banks uh, uh, dominate, it means that there's a much higher requirement for collateral. So in other countries where, 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 um, where the, the, the banks aren't so prominent, uh, you don't have such a such a big requirement, and from our history in terms of uh, the, the previously disadvantaged um, situation, a lot of people that are trying to raise money don't have parents who own assets or don't have the networks where they can actually get um, someone to sign surety for them, which is a big disadvantage. That was a, a big point that came out. Um, the other thing that came out was that it it wasn't well known in this country, but there actually is no good SMME credit data in this country. So consumer data, so in other words, if you as an individual go and um, um, uh, uh, get a, open up an account or you take out a loan, there's an actually a regulated process through the national regulator where data is collected on a monthly basis from every single credit provider in the country. It comes centrally into a hub at SAPRA. The, the, the six main bureaus then pull that on over a three-day period. So whether you have or haven't paid your ETHES account, the information goes through. That you have or haven't paid, whatever it might be, and then every bureau will know where your defaults are or, or, or where you've got certain adverse events. The problem is that that information does not exist for SMEs. And so when you, as an SME owner, go to um, a lender to, to get money, the first thing they do is they look at you as the owner. Now, the reason they do that, and, and I, I want to lobby strongly that that's actually, dis, you know, there, there's discrimination there because ultimately, they're saying that your, the way you manage your personal money is a proxy for the way you manage your business money. Now, the reality is that may not be the case in terms of having other people involved in the business. Also, a lot of 
individuals have, have dug holes and got bad credit reports trying to get their business going. And so now it, 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 it's an indication that they're a bad payer, but in actual fact, they may not be. And also a, a few years ago in this country, it was very easy to get credit before they, they clamped down on that. And a lot of people got themselves into difficult situations, myself included. Um, as an innovator, I took every credit card that would come the moment they would give it to me. And sometimes the way I paid my salaries in the early days was I went and drew every single uh, piece of credit out of that in cash. And then of course we've charged incredible interest rates and, and, and took time to pay that back. So we are putting a project together with the, uh, the Credit Bureau Association and a number of other players, including CFAN and a few others, to actually put together, take a thousand businesses and take uh, seven points of alternate data. We can look at a business and say, right, have you paid your rent? Have you paid your, your internet? Uh, so have you paid your own suppliers, etc.?" And start building a new database of, of information that, that lenders can actually look at the SMEs behavior. So that was another big finding that came out. The other thing of course is that, like Batsy uh, um, um, said, you may match for funding, so you go in and you find a lender, and this guy, will, you actually may, you're a black woman-owned business in Gauteng in construction, you're turning over five million, you're looking for 100,000 working capital, that's who they want to fund, and they ask you, have you got these, have you got your management account, your financial statements, and of course you don't. So it's a bit like finding the person you want to meet on Tinder, but you don't have money to get to the date. Mm -hmm. And your financial, <laughs> statements, <laughs> your financial statements are actually the thing that bring you to that date with the lender because they use that to look at are you bankable, some other documents, can you afford the money that you... So these were some of the things that came out that, that a lot of intervention has to be done to help SMEs there. Um, the credit gap was a lot bigger than people thought. It could be as big as $346 um, billion a year. Uh, for small, it's a big market, but it's a risky market. But the big thing is that, and I'll end on here, Matsi, is that banks actually are struggling to service SMEs because they have a very uh, one-size-fits-all model. Mm. And that one-size-fits-all credit model is for a, a, a large business, a medium business, and a small business. And of course, you know, just take one thing, and what my, my bugbear that many of you that know me will, uh, will say, the one thing they do is they, they look at you as the owner and they ask for your personal bank statements and they want to have a look at did you have a regular salary going in for the last three or six months on a certain day. Now the way entrepreneurs work, we don't work our money like that. You want to pay your staff first, your suppliers. Sometimes the next money is only coming in on the seventh when you're going to pay your PAYE and so, you know, money comes in for that and your salary. So you pay what you need to and you've got kind of a lot of stuff going through your drawings and it's well managed. The problem is with the bank, they've got a stencil and they have a look and they tick, oh, you didn't have it, so okay, now this is risky. You don't have a set salary, so you won't repay the loan. Mm. Now, in a big business, they don't ask the director for his pay slips because they're looking at the business. So again, it's a, so I, I tell SMEs, if you've got 80,000 in the bank and your overheads are 100,000, don't think you're being kind by paying your staff and your suppliers first. If you earn 30 grand, put the money in your account, with whatever it is less tax, 23 X, Y, Z, and the next day transfer 30 back into the business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looks like you've been paid, you don't have any money, so the money's gone back in the business and now you pay the stock. So I was telling the bank straight, you know, that we have to do these workarounds because the system is not set up for SMEs. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other things that, that work like that. And so, um, don't you agree? In this country, there's no transparency of data. So we have VA 200 forms, all the banks um, report their lending to small business, and it gets um, the Reserve Bank give it to us as a, as a macro figure. But it's not broken down, and they say they've lent X many billion to SMEs. Now, between you and I, Anyone who doesn't want to show us what that is, it's because it's probably 90% is medium businesses where there's absolutely no risk. It's not helping the guy on the ground where we actually where some of those jobs are going to come from. And so we lobbied them in that in our launch to say, you have to, other countries release their SME data. The, 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 the rejection rates, the reasons for rejections, um, interest rates, etc. So we, we trusting that um, platforms like FinFind, Venture Central and the others that are, that are coming through um, as data becomes more available now, we're going to start to expose the banks and, 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 and the lenders that are doing that, drive some of those interest rates down and make things more competitive, not so much collateral requests, and, and we're working with government to put new collateral schemes in, etc. So there's a lot more to say, but yeah, that's some of the findings. Right. So that's
um, and we could talk the whole day. About Absolutely. It. Um, I think that's exactly it, uh, Matsi. Uh, we need to find ways in which to encourage uh, money into these, uh, you know, type of high risk uh, businesses, and they call it high risk uh, for several reasons. First of all, I think it's historic. You know, uh, people will say, I think the the, the, bit, the number is like uh, four out of five. Uh, you have startups fail in the first two years, something like that. Now, very difficult to convince people to put money towards something that crashes four out of five times, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that um, uh, um, we've done as a solution, and it was touched on, uh, is that we, 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 we had hope. And I think this is the point about actually directing uh, uh, funds uh, from government uh, to a match fund, uh, because uh, private fund managers really, really spend most of their time um, working with the businesses that they support, making sure that they succeed, um, and, and we call it shared services. So each and every company that um, we, we direct funds to, we provide the ancillary you know, services required to increase the probability of success. And I believe the four out of five is, is huge because it, it probably talks about um, entrepreneurs that are just given money, and then that's it. And then, more often than not, if you're talking about tech uh, companies and innovators, uh, this guy is, is very nuanced in skills, and, and he may he may be an engineer who doesn't like doing admin, you know, who knows nothing about PR or, or HR or marketing, and and and. Mm -hmm. So the the product itself is amazing. However, the business fails because of all of the sort of gaps in, in, in what you need to create a successful business. So I, I would say um, um, to attract more money is to create a model where the investor sort of has confidence that although the, the business is at an early stage, there's a plan in place to, 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 to handhold this business and the entrepreneur to increase the probability of success as well. I think the other thing is um, knowledge and information. Uh, people have a strange relationship with risk, you know. Um, when you say risk, people uh, typically say, no, nah, no, nah, nah, they risk that, they don't want risk. So your, your average citizen um, wants to put money in the bank, which doesn't make sense to me. And I don't want to start talking about banks. Um, <laughs> that's a story for a subject for another day. Yeah, I'll go so, and, and, and I've, 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 my fund is reasonably new. Uh, um, it's, it's actually a, it's, it's one year anniversary uh, a few days ago. Happy anniversary! Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, so, so the point is now I've got new. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of learnings. You know, and what what has um, really been a struggle for me is that most of my invest investors are already high net worth individuals. It's people that are already extremely wealthy who understand risk and return, mm -hmm. and who understand opportunities and who understand uh, uh, the, the fact that to make money you need to risk it. Mm. And the challenge that I've had is that talking, when we started the fund, one of the intentions was to try and expose it to as many ordinary, and this is not condescending with due respect, ordinary South Africans, average South Africans, as far as possible. So our minimum investment we dropped quite a, 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 a lot. I mean, I can tell you now, when we did our market research, the the, the, the minimum investment for Prop J opportunity that we found was three hundred thousand, and um, some were three million. Now that already uh, is outside many South Africans in terms of savings and to be able to access uh, the Prop J opportunity, and we came in at thirty thousand. So we we have nobody close to us in terms of minimum investment. And the reason was that we wanted to give the opportunity most people and obviously they need to wait for five years and, and we're quite confident we'll be successful but if we make them five hundred thousand or a million it's transformative for, for, for an average person to get a lump sum like that you know we won't make them wealthy or anything like that but it could change families lives and what i found is that um first of all i was going to the knowledge issues that most South africans uh, don't understand the risk reward concept and they've been taught to be risk averse. First of all. The other thing is the savings and investment culture that we have. People live hand to mouth. 
a lot of people that I know and others don't, obviously they can't be comfortable and they love what they're doing, they simply don't have money to invest. Mm. You know, they live, they get paid, working for a corporate whatever, the banks take their installments, the rest is paid for the month, on now. end of yeah. the month. <laughs> so, so, so they're living in a cycle, they're in bondage. You know, that's why I hate banks so much. Anyways, <laughs> so, so, so that they caught in the cycle. And whenever their, their financial situation starts to increase, they offer more by the bank, mm. they pull them back down. You know? mm. So it's not promoting a savings account, so we put a thousand a month to be able to actually invest in something and wait and maybe see if it will change your life. So mm -hmm. that's the other thing is that I found I found that, and it's surprising, it's a lot of guys living here in Santon, driving nice cars, living in nice houses, they just don't have money to invest. Mm -hmm. it's, it's strange. The third thing is people don't, uh, I think, take the necessary time to upskill themselves in understanding and knowledge to be able to change their lives. Mm -hmm. So what I found, again, we have quite a complex structure complicated product but again the people that have invested in me uh, who are high net worth it doesn't matter what their qualifications are they'll go and download the white paper for the cryptocurrency they'll go and download my private placement memorandum for the blockchain they'll spend days and weeks if necessary going through it like a, with a fine tooth comb they'll come back ask questions do their due diligence and when they satisfy the invest most people and I'm saying non high net worths immediately they say, ah, Shakes, this is too complicated, or whatever. And I'm like, yes, it's a complex structure, but they don't want to spend the time to actually understand it, and mm. they to change their lives. And this frustrates me greatly, mm. you know. And I don't know, so it's a knowledge culture as well, we're a learning culture where we need to almost uh, get our citizens to try and think about their decisions, want to find out more to change their lives. And, and yeah. Uh, as I said, I'm my father, yes, yeah. because you know we had such an interactive engagement with the catalysts of funding and also the entrepreneurs that have been in the trenches and are struggling. Um, and on behalf of Simodisa, I'd just love to thank you all for participating. Thank our panelists. And good news is, I'm hoping that all of you are actually on our platform. You're part of our membership, which is free. Uh, but we just want to engage with you. Next year, we'll be having investment readiness workshops. So watch the space. We'll be working with our partners and we'd love for you guys to be there because then we'll be able to say, how do you become investment ready? At what stage do you go for funding? And these are some of the platforms that currently exist that will enable you to fund next. So uh, in closing, I'd like to thank our panelists, you, the audiences, our partners, Safka, Shady's representing Safka Well, First National Bank, MTN, Clickatel, uh, my team, Dumi, Charlotte, uh, in absentia, and Mish, um, thank you very much and hope to see you soon. And we thank do you. have some uh, beverages and some refreshments outside. Would love for you to network. Just be